Hi everyone. Okay, so in the next set of videos, we're going to be talking about the concept of self-identity. But before we do that, we need to start off by defining some very important key terms and grasping the understanding behind these terms. So the first is the idea of self-concept. Now, I'm sure you've heard of this before, and I think everyone has a loose um, interpretation of what it is, their own interpretation, but let's talk about it in terms of what psychologists say. So self-concept, according to psychologists, is a term used to refer to how someone thinks about, perceives, or even evaluates themselves. So to be self-aware is to have a self-concept. Now the development of self-concept has two um, aspects. And the first of these is the existential self. And once we have an existential self, an idea of that, we can eventually move on to the categorical self. And I'll explain this relationship in a second. So basically, the existential self is the most basic part of self-concept. So it's a sense of being separate and distinct from others. So these are two very important components of the existential self. We are each separate and distinct entities or objects from others, from other objects, from other people. And an existential self is understanding and having an awareness that the self is constant. So it doesn't change in life. It's pretty constant throughout life. So if someone comes to you and says, I'm tired, that's not their self-concept. It's not a good definition of who they are because it's a temporary state. They're not tired all the time. So self-concept is consistent or constant. Um, and a child as young as two or three months, baby, even realizes this. They realize that they exist separately from others and that they uh, exist over time and space. So this arises due to the part, the relationship the child has with the world. So you've always seen that when a baby smiles, someone else smiles back. Or have you ever seen babies play with the mobile mobiles hanging above their crib? They have this relationship with other objects and they realize that they are separate from that. Now moving on, once we realize that we have an existential self, we can formulate a categorical self. And a categorical self comes once this baby realizes that they are separate. So it's becoming aware that even though we're separate and distinct objects or entities or beings, we also exist in the world. We exist with other objects and beings and entities. And that each of these objects has properties. So at this point, the baby's growing and it's becoming aware that he or she is an object with properties. So usually young toddlers categorize themselves by age or by gender sometimes even by some skills they have, or even by their size, how big or small they are. Now the two of the first categories that young children um, categorize themselves is by age and gender. We always hear little kids saying, I'm three, or I'm five, or I'm a girl. So in early childhood, these categories that children apply themselves to are very concrete. But eventually, as they grow older, as we grow older, we start to categorize ourselves um, by including some more uh, internal psychological traits. So we start to compare ourselves. We start to make um, evaluations and with other people. We start to uh, categorize ourselves maybe by our careers um, or by the type of person that we want to be. So these are more developed categories. Now you probably remember talking um, about Carl Rogers, and I'll just refresh your memory, but he's important in the humanistic um, branch of psychology. So Carl Rogers believed that the self-concept had three different um, components, and the first of these is self-image. So we've all heard of this word before. Self-image is the view we have of ourselves. So there we are. It's what we believe um, we are. The second part of um, his components is self-esteem. So we can use this word along with 
uh, self-worth. So how much value do we place on ourselves? And I'm going to put a little heart here to kind of represent that. So how much love do we um, give ourselves? How much love? How much do we love ourselves? How much value do we place on ourselves? And the third is the ideal self. So it's what we wish to be, what we aspire to be. And I'm going to give it a little star to represent our ideal self. Okay, so developing this idea of self-concept a little further, we can use a theory called the social identity theory. So the social identity theory has um, two parts. It is it defines it, it defines the theory in terms of two parts, and those two parts is the personal identity, which is pretty self-explanatory. So this is the things that are unique to each person, like personality traits. And the other is our social identity. So these include the groups you belong to um, in our community. So in order to understand the social, social identity theory and how um, we categorize ourselves personally and socially, there's a mental process involved in this. So this process involves three steps. And these are the steps we use when we're evaluating ourselves and others and the relationship between person, uh, personal and social identities. So first, all humans categorize themselves. We all categorize our, ourselves without even knowing it. We actually do this entire mental process I'm going to talk about without even really knowing we do it. It's just, I guess, part of human nature. So we categorize ourselves in order to understand objects and identify them. So we categorize people into groups, ones to which we belong and ones that are different from us. So we use social categories like race, so black, white, Australian, Chinese, Christian, student, accountant, whatever it may be. We categorize um, ourselves and people through these categories. And if we can assign people to a category, that tells us things about that person. It, it kind of puts a definition to them, um, a prejudgment. Without fully knowing the person, we have some sort of categor categorical term for them. Now, the second step, once we categorize, is um, identification. Now, let me jump back a little bit um, and just say that it, not all people belong to just one category. We can belong to many different categories. Okay, so the second step is identification. So this is when we adopt the identity of the group. We have categorized ourselves as to belonging. So if we've categorized ourselves as students, the chances are we're going to eventually adopt the identity of a student. And we're going to start acting like a student and behaving like a student. So... Um, this role starts to feel like a norm. We're starting to conform to the norm of the group, the category we belong to. And there's an emotional significance to identification because our self-esteem, which we talked about up here, starts to become bound with this group identification and sense of belonging. And the final step is social comparison. We're always comparing ourselves to others all the time subconsciously, consciously, whatever it is. So once we categorize and identify, we're going to eventually start comparing ourselves with other groups. We're comparing other groups with other groups. And the reason we do this is to maintain our self-esteem. We want to compare ourselves with other groups in a favorable way. And this whole idea is actually very critical in understanding prejudice. Because once two groups identify themselves as separate and rivals, then we start to compete in order to maintain self-esteem. So we're going to look at self-esteem at another point, but just understand that this plays a very important role in this mental process that we formulate in developing a social identity.